my first experiences uh, with poetry uh, beyond nursery rhymes was uh, being forced to read it in high school English classes. Um, forced to read, uh, of course, Romeo and Juliet and uh, was very impressed. Bored with the story, but impressed by the, uh, the ability and it, it made me realize that poetry was a lot more than just roses are red, violets are blue, or there once was a man from Rangoon. And uh, got exposed then to Macbeth and realized that poetry could deal with drama. Still, poetry hadn't made a, a major impression on me until I was exposed to the period of the early 20th century, a uh, period of poetry, and that dealt a great deal with the British poets of the First World War. And that got my attention. I realized then that poetry uh, could deal with the ultimate in realities. And that poetry about war was more powerful and more personal than, say, a charge of the Light Brigade. That it didn't always deal with stories of, of glory and uh, honor and what a splendid experience fighting in a war could be, what, a, what a sport, what adventure. And that that all came back to me uh, while I was in the hospital recovering from wounds and I was struggling to find a way to express my experiences and to try to find a way to convey to other people who had not had that experience, the combat experience, of what that, of what it really was. Since it was so much, so incredibly different than what I had been exposed to as a child growing up watching the movies that had been made before and shortly after World War II. Uh, the first, my first attempt at poetry in dealing with uh, my tour in Vietnam was when I was at Quantico Naval Hospital and I wrote a poem called When Johnny w Was Carried Home. Although I was not against the war at that time, it, I realized as I wrote it that it was uh, certainly had an anti-war uh, theme and of course I envisioned it as being a, a wonderful song sung to the tune of when Johnny was marching home. The subject was of something that I knew happened and that I thought that probably most America didn't realize was happening. And I wrote it from the perspective of a 16-year-old pregnant widow at the gravesite of her 18-year-old Marine husband. Because many of my buddies got their girlfriends pregnant before they went to boot camp and married them before they went to Vietnam. And since we were children, Usually that meant that the, the girls that were sharing our lives were even younger children than we were. And I did know of situations where young men left teenage 
pregnant widows. And I thought that America probably wasn't thinking about that. And it seemed to me that it was awfully important that they should. So that was my first attempt. And it, uh, I doubt that it'll ever be published anywhere. It, it was heartfelt, I'll give it that. I didn't attempt uh, any poetry again until probably 1970 after I'd gotten out of the Marine Corps. And I was struggling with uh, what we used to call the readjustment blues. I had never intended to uh, get out of the Marine Corps. Uh, when I enlisted, I uh, had intended on making it a career. And having gone in at 17, I wasn't prepared for college in any way. I hadn't had algebra, I hadn't had biology, I hadn't taken any courses that would be a requirement for uh, college entrance because I I didn't, couldn't even imagine that I would ever need it. I knew what I wanted to do with my life and I didn't need that crap so I wasn't going to waste my time with it. So being permanently disabled had never dawned on me. I, I knew I could be killed. And after I'd been in combat for a short period of time, I fully expected that I would be killed. But being permanently disabled was just not something that I had thought about. So I found myself uh, out of the Marine Corps I still wasn't old enough to vote or buy a beer. I couldn't get a job. Vietnam veterans that were in perfect physical conditions were having trouble finding work. And if you were disabled, well, you could pretty much just hang that up. And I, I had no real skills behind me. I was an infantry rifleman and not too many people needed men who were proficient with automatic weapons and hand grenades and knew how to set up ambushes and assault bunkers. And so I discovered that all I really had available to me was college. Now I was very fortunate because I was disabled that there was a program available through the Veterans Administration called um, Vocational Rehabilitation for Severely Disabled Veterans. And other than the $135 a month that most veterans got uh, through the GI Bill, I qualified for the, uh, the VA to pay for a full ride in any college that I chose. And much to their dismay, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to make it in a large college. Plus, after having visited a couple of big colleges with my short hair and my hobble, obvious that I was a veteran, I was not treated well, and I had no desire to subject myself to an environment like that. So I chose small schools. And unfortunately for the VA, I chose the two most expensive private schools in the state of Kansas and went to both of them. That would have been Baker University in Baldwin, Kansas and Ottawa University in Ottawa, Kansas. College was a challenge because I wasn't prepared and because I was struggling with my demons. Uh, it's now called post-traumatic stress, but 
and those days we called it the readjustment blues in World War II it was called combat fatigue in World War I it was called shell shock the only thing that uh, everybody could agree on is that it was killing veterans I had never drank alcohol but I began in earnest while I was in the hospital recovering from wounds and that was my defense I drank to excess I was not a social drinker if I sat down to drink I got drunk and I did it to try not to think about what I was thinking about constantly and when your your body has been disabled by wounds it's hard not to think about why that happened when every step and every breath you take brings you pain to remind you and I drank thinking that it would help me escape from those memories those thoughts and it would help me sleep well when I drank just about the only thing I talked about was the war and the alcohol did nothing for the nightmares it probably made them worse but I kept giving it opportunities to change you know the definition of insanity I just kept trying by constantly drinking to get a different result out of it and of course I never did but by 1970 I'm in college I'm in a, a literally a hostile environment I got myself a little tiny trailer down at the end of a dead-end road surrounded by timber and a creek and I bunkered in and I knew I had to do something I had to find some way to deal with these experiences so I told myself I was going to write the great American novel well that fantasy didn't last very long I discovered that my prose really sucks and uh, it in fact it drew flies I just simply could not find the language to describe what I had experienced and in desperation I turned remembering those poets of the First World War Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, Rosenberg, uh, Graves, uh, there's just a, a list of extraordinary poets who dealt with the realities of combat so eloquently that I I grasped at that thought like a drowning man to a fo floating piece of wood something to try to keep my head above water to keep me from drowning in those memories to keep me from from uh, killing myself as I was having a a constant debate with my 45 caliber pistol over my future the thing about depression is that it is one of the few things in this world that can feed on itself and prosper the more you get depressed is the more you get depressed 
it will just keep growing and growing. And I knew I had to find some way. So I began my attempts to describe the combat experience through poetry. Attempts that I'm still pursuing today and I have yet to feel uh, that I have successfully accomplished the task. I've been lucky, um, very lucky. Uh, millions of people write poetry and millions of people write better poetry than I. But by virtue of this wonderful luck that I have always had, uh, my poetry got noticed by people who were capable of doing something with it and helped me get published. And I know lots of fellow Vietnam veterans that write much more eloquent poetry than I ever could who haven't been published. So while it's not fair, I certainly can't complain about my good luck. I went through a short period, man, I think in the late 70s, early 80s, where uh, there were veterans putting out anthologies, quite a few anthologies of Vietnam veteran collections of poetry. And I had sent off pieces during that time period to, uh, to see if I could be published. And I got a couple of individual pieces published, but usually what I got was very nice rejection letters saying that they liked my work, but that it was too graphic and telling me that I should tone it down. And I wasn't going to do that. So I just basically gave up on the idea of ever being uh, published other than the occasional piece. It wasn't until uh, Operation Desert Shield, I think that was what, the early 90s, during the, just leading up to the Gulf of, first Gulf War, that a uh, fellow Vietnam veteran encouraged me to go to an open mic poetry reading on about war held at Kansas University. And I did so and uh, did my one and only public reading of When Johnny Was Carried Home and a few other pieces. So nervous I could hardly get through them. And uh, there was a man in the audience, an Englishman named Brian Daldorf who taught poetry and English literature for the University of Kansas, who is an extraordinary poet in his own right. And he had liked what I'd read and asked if I would read for some of his classes. And that led to his publishing group called Coal City Review, uh, publishing three volumes of my poetry. So, uh, as I've said, I've been very, very lucky. Thus far, uh, with only a couple of exceptions, all of my published stuff has been about the war, although I write about a great many things. Um, it, it seems that most interest in my work has, has been that related to the Vietnam experience. I'm often asked about my work, how I go about writing it, and is it true? And uh, in the interest of being as honest as I can, I'll tell you that they are as true as I can make them. 
Now, what does that mean? Uh, give you some examples. Uh, if you ever read any of my work, uh, in my latest book, Notes to the Man Who Shot Me, the opening poem is um, no, the opening poem is Lisbon, but the I think the second poem is Welcome to MCRD, and it's based upon my experience when I first arrived at the recruit depot after being picked up by a truck along with my buddies, uh, five of us from high school who enlisted together all at 17 uh, at the train station in San Diego and drove us to the Marine Corps recruit depot. And the drill instructor from the receiving barracks came out and before he let us out of the truck, he gave us the welcome aboard speech. Well, by this time, I'm already scared, absolutely spitless, and uh, dealing with a, a phenomenon known as sensory overload. Sensory overload is uh, when you're having an experience that is so new and so intense, your brain is trying to process so much information that it can't literally process all of it. So dealing with the experiences in these poems, often I was dealing with sensory overload. So I took in the poem Welcome to MCRD and another example would be the poem Code of Conduct USMC about a class we had on the code of conduct for service members if they were captured. I took what I could remember and then I added things that other drill instructors had said during my time in boot camp that were apropos to the setting. And then I added things that I, through my experience as a non-commissioned officer in the United States Marine Corps, would have said. And that's how I reconstructed that speech poetically to come out with a poem that expressed the experience, welcome to the Marine Corps Recruit Depot. The thing about writing about experiences that are difficult to articulate, uh, experiences that involve a great deal of emotion, for example, particularly experiences that are not common to all people. And you are writing in the hopes of conveying that experience. The challenge for the poet or any writer is to find a way to construct a narrative that will convey in the best way we are capable that experience to someone who hasn't shared it. So what guides me when I'm writing about combat or any of my experiences in the Marine Corps or about jumping, I, my first rule is that I have to be true to the experience. When writing about combat, the first thing that I discovered is combat is not poetic. So how do you convey the combat experience poetically? It's a challenge. And you take the experience and you can construct a narrative around the experience and hope in the end it will make sense. For me, the challenge combat to me was number one, absolutely terrifying and horrific. It's random acts of senseless violence. And when you write about it, you have to make sense of it. And to make sense of the senseless is, was to me extraordinarily difficult. So 
I had to find different ways to accomplish that. Sometimes I will sit down to write a poem and all I will know is the opening line or the closing line. or the title, the idea that I want to convey. Other times, I will sit down, I will be literally awakened from a deep sleep and have to be compelled to get out of bed and write a poem and it comes to me complete. It's literally like my brain is dictating a finished piece and all I have to do is write it out. Sometimes I'll have a title. Oftentimes there is no title and I don't waste time going back to find a title for a poem. If it isn't born with one, I don't waste time looking for one. Uh, a title's a hook anyway. I've written poems. I wrote a love poem to my rifle. Um, based upon the Rifleman's Creed, the Marine Rifleman's Creed, and it's entitled M16A1. There are many like it, but this one is mine. And I wrote the poem to convey to the reader what it was like to be a rifleman in combat and have your country issue you a rifle that doesn't work. And so what that poem is is a plea to this rifle not to fail me and my pledge that I will not fail it if it will only not fail me. In combat they say if there's 50 people in a fight there are 50 different fights and that's because every man experiences it in a different way and your world shrinks considerably when you are terrified and preparing for what you believe is your eventual death. Especially in combat in Vietnam where at times when we would hit the dirt, when we would go to ground, we would be in deep jungle foliage and although there were men five, six, seven, eight feet to either side of you, you couldn't see them. And you felt completely alone. And you felt like everybody was shooting just at you. And what I have tried to do with my work is to convey that sense the individual response to that level of terror. What I have attempted to be as a much as an observer, as a participant with my writing and what I hope I have accomplished is that I have been true to the experience so that men who haven't that weren't in the same fights I was, men that weren't even in the same war that I was, can come up to me and look me in the eye and say, there it is. That's exactly what it was like. You told my story. Or I've, want, I've had my wife and children read this book because you got it right. That's the gauge of success for me, is when a fellow veteran will come up and tell me that I got it right. Or when a civilian will come up to me and s tell me that they think now they have some grasp of what those of us who served in combat experienced. That's all I ever hope to accomplish in the first place. In the spring
spring of 2017, I was awarded the Robert Gannon uh, Award for Poetry from the Marine Corps Heritage Association at the, it was presented at the uh, Marine Corps Museum in Quantico, Virginia, and was presented to me by the Commandant of the Marine Corps. To have the Marine Corps acknowledge my work just meant the world to me because I, my Marine Corps experience was one of the most positive experiences of my life. And my feelings about the war in which I fought has nothing at all to do with my feelings about the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps did not start that war. The Marine Corps was issued that war by the government of the United States. I have often been asked, about my Vietnam experience. I've had people who have read my work say, that must have been the worst experience of your life. And I literally had a time when I decided that I had to find, I had to, I had to face that experience and decide for myself whether it was one of the most positive experiences of my life or one of the most negative. And I literally wrote down on a tablet all the reasons why it was the most negative experience. And I got tired because I'd gone into several pages and I stopped and I thought, well, you know what? I need to, I need to write down some things that make it a positive experience. And I only wrote down one thing before I knew that I, I was done with this project. I wrote down my buddies, and that, that was it. Uh, that's what made my Vietnam experience one of the most positive experiences of my life. I cannot imagine who I would be had I not have met those men, had I not have known them, been inspired by them, loved them and been loved by them. And that, that far outweighs all the negative experiences I had, all the terror, all the horror, the honor and the privilege of knowing those guys, a bunch, mostly teenagers poor and working class, and the finest young Americans that I've ever met. The title poem to my latest book is Notes to the Man Who Shot Me. I came to write that as a result of my negotiating a personal ceasefire. I realized after 35 years that I had to find some way to take control of my Vietnam experience. So I began negotiating with myself on what it would take to have a ceasefire in my life. I realized that I could not move forward with my life if I continued to hate the North Vietnamese soldiers that I had fought, and particularly the North Vietnamese soldier who had shot me the last time I was wounded and had used me as bait to get my buddies who came to my rescue. So, I wrote the poem, Notes to the Man Who Shot Me, as my declaration of peace. And I buried the hatred 
that I had been carrying for all those years and all that hatred had done was hold me back. It had weighted me down. It wasn't doing me a damn bit of good. But I, I clung to it. As if my life depended on it. When actually, it was It was ruining my life. And I had this epiphany. So I wrote to the man who shot me and told him, although he's dead, he was killed in the fight, I still had to talk to him directly and tell him that I, that I knew he and I had more in common than we did with the men who sent us to kill each other. I decided that I had to do a rewrite of Notes of the Man Who Shot Me uh, for two reasons. One, originally I had only written it from my specific point of view and I had overlooked the valor of two members of my platoon that I witnessed prior to my being shot. And two, I recently came across uh, new information about that fight that um, I needed to correct um, my poem to reflect the new information that I'd received. A good friend of mine, John Solbach, who is a Marine who fought in the same area at the same time as I did, got me the official after action report on that fight. It is the only thing I have ever seen about the fight. And uh, the only outside information I've ever received. Uh, discovered that my platoon, which is approximately 30 Marines, uh, ran into a North Vietnamese Army battalion. And we're talking hundreds of North Vietnamese soldiers. That's what initiated the fight. Now the after action report only has one paragraph that deals with the fight and only about four or five sentences of that paragraph deal with uh, our part in it. I had originally thought, and I was one of the first probably five people to be shot in the initial ambush. Uh, and I originally had thought that we had several killed. But the uh, official casualty report was one killed in action and 19 wounded in action, according to the after action report. It was significant to me because for nearly 50 years, I had thought that I caused two Marines to be killed in their attempts to rescue me. So I needed to correct that in the poem. And while this new information I now know that I didn't cause the deaths of two Marines. I'm still stuck with the guilt that I have been carrying all these years. And I, I don't know how to you know, it's one thing to accept new facts and to know intellectually that I didn't get two men killed. But it's another to be able to divest myself of the guilt that I have been carrying for all those years for the two men I thought I had caused to die.
So with those things in mind, I felt it, since this is, I think, the most important thing I've ever written, I had to rewrite it. So I would like to close with the rewrite of Notes to the Man Who Shot Me. When the ambush was sprung, everything became chaos. In the initial burst of fire, our platoon hit the deck, all except Leonard, who stayed up and fought until he took a bullet in the chest. He collapsed like a pu puppet with his strings cut. As your battalion held us under fire, Sloan suddenly leapt over us like a runner clearing the high hurdles, calling out Leonard's name. As I got up to follow Sloan, you fired your first burst at me. A ricochet clipped my chin and dropped me face first to the ground. You were a veteran. You knew that Marines never leave their wounded. And that's when I became your bait. You held your fire until one of my buddies came to me and began to lift me by my shoulders before you walked that second burst into my chest. Do you recall how the impact of those bullets tore me screaming from his arms? I think you shot him too. You may have shot others before you were killed and I was rescued. If you did, you made me your accomplice in the fight against my friends. And that haunts me to this day. I have often thought of you all these years and hated you for using me as bait. But the truth is, had our roles been reversed, I would have done the same. I wish now that I could talk to you. I wonder how I look to you. I wonder, were you as terrified as I was? I wonder, did you hate me as much as I hated you? I wonder how long you'd been fighting your war. I wonder if you had any children. And I wonder, had you survived and we met today, would you speak to me? I sometimes imagine us meeting again and talking about that ambush while our children play together. You were a good soldier. Now I've come to realize that you and I had more in common than we did with the men who sent us to kill each other. If I could, I would give you the gift I have longed for all these years, the gift of peace.